Luke 18, verse 9 says, He also told his parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. That word contempt is a pretty powerful word. It's a man named John Gottman. He's a researcher and writer on marriage. And he says contempt is the biggest predictor of divorce when he sees that in a marriage. He says 95% of the time, if people hold themselves, each other in contempt in some way, it will end in, mar- in, in divorce. And, what's, and, it's, and what it is, is one has contempt for the other. And just to quote this man, he says, Contempt is the most destructive of the four horsemen because it conveys, I'm better than you. I don't respect you. The target of contempt is made to feel despised and worthless. Treating us or others with disrespect and mocking them with sarcasm are forms of contempt. So, are, so is hostile humor, name-calling, mimicking, and or body language such as rolling your eyes and sneering. In this man's book, Why Marriages Succeed or Fail, Mr. Gottman notes, when, pe- when, when contempt begins to overwhelm your relationship, you tend to forget entirely your partner's positive qualities, at least while you're feeling upset. You can't remember a single positive quality or act. This immediate decay of admiration is an important reason why contempt ought to be banned from marital interactions. Contempt erodes the bond that holds a couple securely together. It's impossible to build connection when your relationship is deprived of respect. The existence of contempt is the biggest predictor of divorce. And that's what Mr. Gottman says. I think that's very true. And this is one way... And, of course, just in marriage like that, it's one way contempt can be seen in someone's life, in their marriage relationship. And contempt basically is the, is the result of a wrong attitude. And Jesus challenges us all in these verses that are going to be coming to all of us to correct our attitude because we can all have this kind of attitude. Just as quick background, in the beginning of the chapter, verses 1 to 8 of uh, Luke 18, Jesus encouraged his followers to pray and not lose heart having us look to God in his, and his gracious character. And Jesus continues to talk about prayer in this next section now, um, but the emphasis shifts, and it shifts to the person added, person's attitude who is praying. And you're also looking at that person who, to whom God's grace, graciousness is extended. What is that person like? So we will see a parable to correct a wrong attitude. And we'll start again. I'll just read verse 9 again here. And he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Now that word right at the beginning there, he also, the word also, it connects us to the beginning of the chapter. Right at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus said, but he told them a parable. And then he's saying here, and he also told this parable. So it's basically at the same time. And it continues his teaching on a related topic of prayer, but like I said, emphasizing attitude in this case. He also also shows us that he's addressing his followers, and particularly, it says there are some who trusted in themselves. So he's singling out perhaps a group there. Now Jesus is not singling out, as we might think later, the Pharisees, as he loses a Pharisee as an example in his parable. What he's singling out is the attitude the Pharisee exhibits. The attitude that basically anyone could exhibit. They were just really good at it. And that includes Jesus' followers. Because as we're going to see in verse 15, a little further down, that Jesus' followers um, were showing the same kind of attitude. And all of us need to make sure we don't have this kind of attitude. What specifically is the attitude? Well, firstly, it says there that the person trusted in themselves. And as a result of that, they treated others with contempt. The first one breeds the second. Trusting in yourself breeds contempt for other people. If you depend on your own goodness and think you can live properly before God by yourself, then you don't need God's grace and God's mercy. And this leads to looking down at people who you see as not living properly before God. We may say, well, I trust God for his mercy. I don't trust in my own righteousness. But if you ever find yourself looking down at others for any reason, you probably really are trusting yourself. The word contempt means to treat someone like they have no merit, they have no worth. You disdain them, basically. They aren't as good or as smart as you, and so you feel you have the right to look down on them. 
or to exclude their ideas or their contributions as unworthy. And this is the underlying character that God, Jesus says is not to be a part of any of his followers, of any of us. And so he wants to show us the difference between that, the attitude of contempt, and that attitude of humility, which is what God does want in his people. So the characters of the story. Now these are two characters that are going to be contrasted in the story. And we're going to note these contrasts as we kind of go through and look at them. So verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. A Pharisee, one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. So the setting, of course, is the Jewish temple. And this is, a, this is the Jewish place of prayer. This is the primary place because they were the closest to God physically that they could get. You even see that in Israel today. They go to the Wailing Wall because that's the closest they could get to where the temple once stood. Now we have the first person also is the Pharisee. Now this, is a kind of, this guy is a someone who belongs to the Jewish religious sect. and They were leaders of the people. And they valued God's law very highly. Unfortunately, so highly that they tried to protect it by adding other things to it and to try to clarify the application of God's law. And throughout Luke, the book of Luke, the Pharisees were critical of Jesus as he challenged those additions to the law that they made, as well as their ungodly attitudes, such as how they promoted themselves. So the Pharisees well represent the wrong attitude that Jesus is going to be trying to illustrate, not trying to, he illustrates it very well in this parable. The other person in this uh, story is the tax collector. Now, these people are seen throughout Luke in a little different way. We often see them as people who respond well to Jesus's message. These are Jewish citizens who collected taxes for Rome and were seen because of that as traitors. Also, they would overcharge the taxes and keep it, basically stealing from their own people, making themselves rich. And so they were hated and despised as both traitors and as oppressive criminals. They were also a group, though, that knew their sin. And they saw their need for reconciliation with God. And so they listened and they responded positively to Jesus. So you have the ex two extremes. You have the religious goody two-shoes who are self-righteous and looking down on people who think that who people that they think aren't as good as themselves. And then you have the lowest, the most despised of society who know they're not good in God's eyes. So let's see the one who trusted himself in verses 11 and 12. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. Now it starts by saying he's standing by himself. Basically, he separated himself from other people in the temple. And as you read his prayer, it's pretty obvious he's separating himself because he doesn't want to be around other people that aren't as good as him. We'll see that this tax collector, he also separates himself, but it's a pretty different reason that he does it. His prayer starts by thanking God, which is kind of a good start, but he doesn't thank God for anything God did. He's thankful for himself, who he is and what he's done. He's unique. He's not like other men, as he says. He's not an extortioner. That's how my Bible puts it. The better word, better translation is probably swindler, which is uh, uh, the one Forbes read. He's, he's not unjust. He's not an adulterer. But the fact is, he is absolutely blind to who he really is. Because earlier in Luke, in the, the sections before this, Jesus showed the Pharisees they were all three of those things. They were guilty of all of them. In uh, Luke 11:39, Jesus pointed out their greed. That's being a swindler, a robber. In Luke 11:42, Jesus pointed out their injustice. But woe to you, Pharisees, he said, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. And also in, in Luke 16:18. Jesus said that because they had relaxed the laws of divorce, they caused adultery. So he was thankful that he was not like other men because they weren't extortioners, unjust, and adulterers. And Jesus had already pointed out to them, you guys are all those things. So even though the Pharisee said he was not like other men, he really was. 
The Pharisee then places the tax collector as the epitome of low people. He says, even like this tax collector. And you can see how Jesus says this man treated others with contempt. Both in separating himself from the temple and just his attitude of looking down on others. The Pharisee was also very thankful for what he had done. That he, had, he fasted and he was tithing. And these are things that the Bible does promote. They're things that there are times to fast and to pray. And God does want his people to give generously of what they receive. But the Pharisee is the one who takes full credit for his good deeds. He's proud of what he's doing as if God somehow needs it. His prayer shows that he wants everyone else to know it as well. And this is the attitude that Jesus is showing us that displeases God. God is not exactly happy with this kind of attitude. Well, let's see the one who does have the right attitude. The attitude of humility. Verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You can see right away why this man start, stood far off, separated, separating himself from others. It was the weight of his sorrow, the weight of his guilt before God. He wouldn't even dare lift his eyes up to God. He wouldn't do that. He was just like looking down. He, he didn't feel worthy. He didn't feel worthy to come to God at all. And this is very different, of course, than the Pharisee. He separated himself because he felt himself more superior than others. In fact, even worthy of God. The tax collector knew he wasn't worthy to come to God. And so he calls on God for mercy. Not lifting his eyes and beating his chest just like, Oh God, please have mercy on me. These are all outward signs of the kind of shame, that the deep doubt that he felt for his sin. My version of the Bible, ESV, translates his request as being merciful to me. The Greek word carries actually the meaning. It is part of that meaning for sure. It carries that meaning. But also of him asking God to be gracious to him and to reconcile himself to God. Just like he was saying, God, please reconcile me to yourself. He knew he didn't deserve it, but he was sorry for his sin and he was pleading for God for mercy, to deal with him with mercy and befriend him anyway. And this, of course, is very different, contrasting with a Pharisee. The one who insisted, who instead recognized his, this is very different from the Pharisee who instead of recognizing his own need, sin and need, he spoke of his own goodness. He didn't need God's mercy. He just, he, God just needed to know how good he was and he told him that. This contrast is meant to help us think about what our own attitude is. Do we think we're okay and that God wouldn't be unhappy with us? Or do we recognize our sin and that we are not as good and as righteous as God himself is? Comparing our goodness with other people like the Pharisee isn't exactly wise. We need to compare ourselves with who God himself is and realize we aren't even worthy to come to God at all. We just aren't worthy even to do that. But the good news is that even though we aren't worthy to come to God to anything, if we will come to God in the attitude of this tax collector of confession of sorrow and confession and sorrow and submission to God, God will extend to us what we don't deserve. He will extend to us mercy and forgiveness. And the reason God will extend that mercy and forgiveness is for something Jesus isn't even saying here yet. Because it hadn't happened yet. Jesus was going to die for that tax collector's sins. As well as for your sins and my sins and everyone else's. We don't deserve God's mercy and forgiveness either. Because... And what we do deserve is God's punishment. But Jesus took that punishment on himself as the perfect son of God, dying on the cross and rising three days later. And if, like the tax collector, we would just see and admit our unworthiness to God and trust Jesus to remove the penalty of sin and, that, and ask him to reconcile us to God, God does and will accept us as his children. And he will remove that debt our charges that are against us, acquitting us of those charges and even accounting to us the righteousness of Jesus. And this is what's called being justified. It's what God did for the tax collector. So who of those two is God pleased with? Let's read verse 14. 
I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, the tax collector, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Neither the Pharisee nor the tax collector in themselves was righteous enough to meet God's perfect standard. But the tax collector at least knew it, and he humbled himself before God and asked for what he didn't deserve, and he received it. He was justified. He was made free of the charges of sin against him because of Jesus. The other one enhanced his own honor and thus received nothing from God. As far as he was concerned, he was just fine before God. But when he comes face to face to God, God will humble him and will not acquit him of the charges that are against him. So which attitude do we find in ourselves? Which attitude do you find in yourself? When we look at our own sin, we may have this, humil- this attitude of humility and repentance. What about other situations? Do we ever treat others with contempt? Looking down on someone is not as good or not as smart or not as able to do something as well as I can or you can. We need to watch ourselves in all kinds of situations because we're gonna, as we're going to see in the next verse, verses, the disciples were not getting the message and they were not seeing how they were looking down on some others that they didn't think were very high in status. In this case, children. Children will be the, an example of humility in verses 15 to 17. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to them and say, saying, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. The disciples did not think that children were worthwhile enough for Jesus to bother with them. So they told the people who were bringing the children to Jesus to get lost. Now we value children very highly, and our government has given them protection and rights. But it's not always been that way, and this culture did not view children the way we do now. Children were viewed essentially as not adults. They were not bringing any valuable contributions worthwhile, uh, work-wise, basically. They were treated the same as a slave. They were to be subordinate, and they were inferior. They had no inherent value even as humans and were expendable. They were seen as only potentially valuable once they were old enough. And of course, there was reasons, some reasons for that. Many ended up dying of diseases. Babies, especially in those days, were highly susceptible to physical problems and diseases. And they had a very high mortality rate. So it's a bit understandable that Jesus' disciples would do as they, would do as they did. It was a normal way of thinking about children in those days. But Jesus is not going to have any of it. Number one, because he evidently doesn't hold that kind of view of children. And number two, he wanted to make an important point, showing an example of the kind of humility that God is pleased with. Jesus called the children to him and told the disciples to let them come because to to such, the children, belongs the kingdom of God. Such belongs the kingdom of God. What do you mean by such? See, God values all people including and especially those whose society doesn't value. The kingdom of God belongs to those who are like the tax collector, who sees his sin and his need. The kingdom of God belongs to those who know they are not good enough, but will still call on God. The kingdom of God belongs to fishermen from Galilee. The kingdom of God belongs to farmers, to ranchers, to businessmen from Golden Prairie. Jesus' punchline right at the end there is, is, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. There must be humility. There must be reaching out to God as a person of need, trusting that God will be merciful. See, if, you're a per, if you come to God as a person of ability, of self-sufficiency, of self-righteousness or arrogance, that means you will not receive the kingdom of God. So how is our attitude? If we would look at ourselves, what is our attitude? And examining ourselves goes against the grain for many people because we don't want to admit our weaknesses, our inadequacies, our needs. But unless we recognize who we are before a righteous and a holy God, 
and are repentant, helpless sinners who need mercy, then we are like the Pharisee, figuring we're good enough on our own. But for those who will recognize and who will acknowledge their need and will confess and turn from their sin and trust Jesus to have provided for forgiveness, God will respond with mercy and forgiveness, bringing us into a full and life-giving relationship with him. And how do we look at people around us? Do we see everyone else as equal before God and all of us in need of mercy? Or do we hold others in contempt? Do we ever look down on people thinking that, thinking that we are somehow better, somehow inferior to them? And honestly, I doubt any one of us can answer no to that question. We all look down on people at some times in our lives. But God desires that we have the attitude of humility like children do. And that is something we need to pray and ask God to give us. So are you willing to pray, God humble me? Now those words might be easy to say, but the hard attitude of even desiring difficult can sometimes be very difficult to get to. And if we ask God to humble us, he will. And that's not always comfortable. But the, but the reward is a much closer relationship with him. So are you willing to take the risk? Are you willing to ask God to humble you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this story, for this example of two people. And just what are you pleased with? Father, what, what is my life like? Am I humble before you? Do I think I'm good enough? Father, help me to know that nothing that I can do or be is anything but what you have given And I thank you for that. Thank you for your free gift of forgiveness, of salvation in Jesus, of rescue from the penalty of sin, the death that I deserve. Thank you that you give that. Thank you for helping us to see where we need you. Help us to call out to you in our need and rely on you because you are sufficient. You took our sin on the cross and died there for us. And we can be totally forgiven. And we can live in a humble manner before you because your Holy Spirit fills us and strengthens us and helps us to live the life that you want us to live. Thank you that you give us all we need and you are the supplier of those needs. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.